Hi, thanks for tuning in to Thought Rock. This is our uh, second program on what is truth. I'm here with my good friend Mike Satterfield. Yo. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. doing well. Yeah. We talked a lot last time about the dictionary definitions of truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, we looked at Webster. We looked at uh, the Oxford. and kind of went through that in somewhat of some detail. Um, we want to kind of broaden it out a little bit today and, and talk. We, we kind of talked a little bit at the end of the program. If you're a student, you're you know in university, you don't have uh, maybe any kind of spiritual grid. You don't have a lot of, you haven't given a lot of thought to, to the concept of truth, but it's now starting to come up. So where do you turn? Where do you go? And we had kind of mentioned at the end of the program last time about looking at the three basic streams that kind of flow into a young person's life. Right. Right. So do you want to talk a little bit about those? You want yeah. to mention what they are? Or- yeah. I think we, we had disseminated really, you know, identify three classical streams and then there's a, a, a new, in the modern era, a fourth stream, but right. uh, family. Uh, being the primary, uh, for lack of a better word, indoctrination agent in the life of a child, teaching them about the world around them and what is true. And then the church being a a, a big part of that, especially in American culture in decades past, not so much today as as influential. And then the school system, which, uh, man, that's a whole other topic, isn't it? It's like start to look at John Dewey and, and uh, some of the um, the seeds that were sown in the formation of the right. American public school system and, and uh, what the intent on you know was for some of those people uh, that's that's I think largely to blame for some of where we are today as a culture right so right so you have those three streams um, converging uh, in, in, in ages past I think, Helping one another, working with one another, caring about the the children, the students, and trying to to form a whole person, trying to not just impart knowledge for its own sake, but truth as part of a worldview, a larger worldview. It's interesting, like because you know when you think of a child, and I got you know we've we've both raised kids, and I've got you know I'm now into the grandchild zone, so I got some new toddlers. I'm not ready. <laughs> You're not ready. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't think I was ready either. I thought if my first one came along, I was only in my early fifties. Whoa, 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 whoa! Let's just yeah. slow this boat right down. You yeah, know? Yeah. Yeah. My I, yeah, I was fifty when my first grandchild was born. I was like, whoa, man, I'm feeling old now. <laughs> but it's interesting to watch these little dudes because they I got you know two boys. Uh, Rambo and Tank, that's the nicknames that I've given them, right. and uh, and then three awesome little girls. But watching watching them develop and watching them learn, you see how they're constantly reaching out, right? Constantly mm-hmm. looking, constantly trying to discover, and how important the teachable moments are in yeah. family life. Yeah. And you know, I'm very thankful I've got two wonderful daughters and two great son-in-laws and and so I've I've noticed them and we've we've taught them to be very deliberate yeah. in imparting information and education yeah. to that child when it comes to respect, discipline, you know, what is right, what is wrong, all those values where that's a very important part of what you do with a young child yeah. from toddlerhood basically onward right absolutely so i think of and i want to kind of stop at the family for a minute because when you look at the family with a healthy you know mother and father and we know there are people out there and some of our viewers and students who have grown up in situations other than that through no fault of their own some families have gone through Mm. divorce some have gone through death right there are many different circumstances of why a child is raised by a single parent and single parents uh, in many cases do an incredible they do the job of two people in many cases yeah so but ultimately when you are in a situation where you have a father and a mother and you have children in that environment um, that is such a a powerful force of stability for a child to be introduced into the world. Absolutely. Because a child's world in the first, well, five years is pretty limited to his family and wherever mom and dad are taking him. That's it. Right? 
So why why do you think? Yeah, and I mean, you know, before television came along, way back in the dark ages, you know, kids did spend much more time with adults. Right. They um, the whole apprenticing thing. You went out. And, and you helped your dad or your grandpa yeah. in the garage, on yeah. the farm. You know, you were le- constantly having input in a learning environment. Yes. Why is that so important? Well, I think one of the reasons uh, kids learn better, I mean, especially young children, are not cognitively developed to the place of abstraction, right? Right. And so concrete experiences... Touching things, smelling things, feeling. Right. All of that is a, a really necessary component, especially in the early years of learning. That's why kids put things in their mouths. Right. They're, they're exploring the world. They're discovering yeah. this place that they've been born into. And, Does it um, taste good and can I eat right. it? Right. <laughs> that's it, man. <laughs> That's my that's my grandson Rambo. He's yep. got arms like Popeye. He's so he's so big. He's so he's so fat. He's gonna be like nine months or whatever. He's got like roll, roll, and roll. It's just like these strong and everything. He just wants to. He's teetering right now. He's just cucumber. Arr, he just wants to just chew yeah. on everything he can get his hands on. Yeah. Right? Anyway, but well, yeah, I think so that's that, it. Like the sen- the f- the five senses are yeah. are uh, part of our learning, right. right? Especially in the early years, right? And family gives you should ideally give you the parameters, the safety parameters to to explore your world as right. a small child and discover things. You know, you get at least one parent all the time watching you, hopefully, and yeah. and keeping you from swallowing. You know, the bug that you just put in your mouth or whatever. You, the right? slug. The, the, oh man! <laughs> yeah, I remember that day. Uh, <laughs> In the garden, you did that. Or? No, no, the ch- oh, okay. my kids. Half a slug. She's sitting in the garden, this half oh. a slug in her hand, and she's chomping. That cannot taste. That, good. that is not. I don't That's know what it's. Yeah, she's. Yeah, Ooh. it's. She's like escargot ever since. So I don't know what to do. No. Wow. Wow. But okay. So you look at a, you look you look at a child in that environment, and you know one of the things that really upsets me today is when I hear people referring to kids as almost like an imposition or they're a burden. they're a burden or I don't want to you know if I have to you know I'm going to sacrifice my career for kids or right. you know that whole thing it's like kids are what it's about yeah right your life is about reproducing yourself in in a very real way I mean yeah. that was a very that's a very important thing and and so so one thing about having kids is you stop you, you can no longer focus on yourself. You have to focus on them. Right. You know, as far, you know, they, they have to have priority because they're dependent. Yes. And you turn from being self-absorbed to family absorbed. Correct. So even that educational shift in a young adult, you know, young couple's yeah. life. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. even with the, that is a good educational experience as a person in your early 20s or late 20s or 30s. Sure. Right? That in itself. Yeah. But for the child to be born into something where they're highly valued and cherished. Right. That was celebrated. Right. That was a big part. We celebrated that. Yeah. We valued that. We poured energy into that. Yeah. Today I feel it's like, well, you know, we got to get daycare for them. We got to we keep we keep pushing our children into these environments yes. that are no longer family focused environments. Yeah. They're we're we're almost subcontracting out yeah, the that's family true. job. That's exactly right. Right? Yeah. So I mean I remember when we had children, my wife was a career person, I was a career person obviously, and we made a decision as a couple that when our kids were born, she was going to focus on the children for at least the first formative years. And she went to part time work she ended up, you know, adjusting her career path, and then as the kids went into school, she actually changed her career path to be in the school system. Yeah, and so that she was cognitive, she was consciously working with our kids and her job. She synergized those two things so that she could focus on our kids. Absolutely right. And of course, I was the the, the main breadwinner at that point, and then I would, you know came and supported around that with my efforts. Right. Um, but boy, we focused on those kids. Yeah. yeah. And we 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 would sit down at, you know, family dinners were important. Yes. Because 
I wanted them to know what was true about everything they had questions. Yeah. And kids had yeah. have a zillion questions. So family dinner time, we would sit down and say, well, what are the questions of the day? You know, what did you learn? What are, what do you want to know? What what's wh- what are you interested in right now? You know, right. what 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 do we need to talk about today? Yeah. Those are powerful times. Absolutely. In that river of forming truth in a child's life. Yeah. Well, you know, we we started our family. Uh, we discovered really quickly that there was more of an educational experience for us as parents. Yes. Well, as an education, is just getting married. Right. I mean, suddenly yeah. you can't be the center of your universe as selfish as you had no idea you actually were. Right? You discover <laughs> just how selfish and self-centered you are when you have to care for another person yeah. and consider them in your decision making. And then you bring this little mini me into the world, right? And it just, it man, it just it multiplies, right? Absolutely, it, it amps it up. And so, um, when we ha- we were starting our family, we were doing campus ministry at the University of Georgia, right? And my, you know, college students they want to stay out all night and hang out, and sure. So my evenings were just booked. Right. So we we just said, okay, we're going to homeschool the kids. So that I can be home in the mornings, I can be around from wow. waking waking yep. hour till lunchtime, yep. and then I'll go to work. But I want to be with my kids. I want to be part of the yes. inculcation of my children into a Judeo Christian worldview, and, and and to have that level of intentionality about it. Right. And so we do breakfast. We so we didn't have family dinner. We had family breakfast. Cool. Yeah. Right. And we we read a section of scripture. And yep. talk about it, even when the kids are super small, yep. and they couldn't, they they weren't cognitively, you know, dissecting, you know, the the exposition of scripture. Sure, but but they were hearing the word, and we were talking about the word, and we were laughing together, and right. eating our meal, and and those were precious times for us. Well, I remember when I was a child myself. Um, of course, you, tele- you remember? I remember that, that far oh, back. Gosh. That's the that shows you the amazing memory that I have. <laughs> I'm like an elephant. They never forget. In <laughs> <laughs> more ways than one. But anyway, mm. so, but I remember as a kid, okay, we, my mom and dad did not have a TV right. for the first uh, nine years of my growing up. And um, and that was intentional for them because my mom was an educator. Yeah. And my mom wanted us to focus on reading and learning. And so she had been a, t- a school teacher and a very gifted one. And so she had spent my formative years, basically, I, w- I went to public school back in the day, but mom taught us. Yeah, yeah. And she had books and all kinds of stories and things for us to read, classical stories, biblical stories. In fact, I still remember the Bible story book that she had. Very, It was a pictorial kind of a Bible story book. And I remember reading through those stories, and you had mentioned something about not understanding the, you know, maybe the doctrinal concepts or, or some of the big mm-hmm. bridges. But what I learned was that I learned the stories. Yeah. And the stories fascinated me. Like, for when I went through as a child, my, in the first eight years of my life, my Superman was like Joseph and David. And right. like they were all those hero figures of, of the Bible stories. Yeah. Were that was my Marvel comic as far as I was as far as I knew as a child, yeah, yeah. and then later on they got a television because we we're always over at the neighbors watching stuff. So they thought, well, okay, we better monitor here what they're watching. Sure. So then they got a TV, but but it was interesting in that for those first years, my mother was ve- and my father was they were very concerned that a we learned to read well. Yeah. Okay. They wanted us to know how to read and comprehend well. And they wanted to guide us, and they wanted to filter the information that we read because they were educated people, and they knew those basic things that we needed to learn. Right. So in those formative years, great emphasis was placed on us learning how to discern truth Yes. as even little kids. Right. And I think there's a, a sad lack in a lot of families today where no one's actually sat down and talked about this issue yeah. and how to take your child and put them on a road of basic truth at a young age, teaching them those yeah. principles of discerning what truth is. Well, we're, we're not even close to that. I mean, that that's like eight levels up from where our culture actually is. And what, most, what I see a lot of parents doing is um, they don't want to be bothered. Right. by their kids. Um, here's here's a screen. Here's a mobile device at 
three, three years old. Right. Occupy yourself and don't Bug don't me. bother me. Right. Kid, is the message I see a lot of parents, whether intentionally or unintentionally, that's what they're communicating to their kid. Leave me like go go play, go right. do something. Leave me alone. I don't want to be bothered. Well, and I think too one of the things that's fed this problem, and I and I and I because I want to be compassionate to the situation too. Yeah. I you know back. You know, in the dark ages of the 1960s, it took one income to feed and raise a family and buy a house. My mm-hmm. dad could work effectively by himself. Yes. And he could provide for uh, our family. Right. And you may think that's patriarchal and sexist and blah, blah, blah. It meant my mother had the option to stay home if she wanted to. Yeah. Or she could work if she wanted to. She chose to stay home and she could afford to do it. Right. So because of that... They could take the time to invest in us boys. Right. Okay. And I grew up in an army of boys. So no girls. And so that's why. Anyway. But there's a lot of. Anyway. So so we grew up in an army of boys. And, and, and my mother educated us and spent those years doing that. To, you know, as things progressed, it took, you know, two incomes almost when, when I got married yeah. to make a house payment and to make it work. Now it almost takes takes two incomes and you need to have a rental suite in your basement right. to make it, you know what I mean? Yeah, so of, economically, yeah. Yeah. it's put a lot more pressure yeah. on the family. Absolutely. So I think parents are more pressured today. Yeah. Financially, it's more difficult. Um, you know, my dad commuted, I think it was 15 minutes to work and back yeah. in the formative years of my life. How many people listening to this probably commute 45 minutes each way? Right. You know, so there are real issues yes. that from the outside that are putting a squeeze on the family. Right. So you have to really fight harder today. That's young, it. Right. You have to fight harder for those values. Yeah. So maybe you do have to live. Um, in a smaller house and you don't have that house ambition, you know, or maybe, you know, that second car doesn't have to be new. It can be, you know, used, you know, you can change things for a few, and it's only a few years, but for those years when your children are formative, I think if you want to see them really succeed, Mm -hmm. you've got to spend time because you are the stream of truth and education that they're going to receive or like you said, you're gonna you're gonna subcontract that out to a screen, right? And we'll talk about that in a minute because that's yeah. the fourth yeah. kind of stream. Yeah, we'll get there, and we'll get there. <clears throat> so when I think of a family, I think of how important you know taking time with your children is to you know educate them yourself, to spend time with them, to play with them. Absolutely, my. Um, well, I think she's my four. Yeah, my Primrose, my she's just almost three. She's just three, and she went through her terrible twos in the last you know eight or nine months, where she didn't like her father and she didn't like Papa. Mm. Okay, you know I love Nana. Nana, of course, is queen. Yeah, she loves her mother, but she doesn't like Papa and she doesn't like Dad. Okay, yeah. so that was six months of that. Yeah, and I thought I got to I got okay. This, it's a toddler feminist. It's a, it's a, yeah. she's, a, she's a feminist toddler, and so anyway, so I was like, I'm not having this. I'm gonna I'm gonna I am gonna win your heart if it kills me. Yeah, you know. So I would do everything. I tried to. I brought her chocolate sometimes. Just like you know, I'd bring her chocolate where she look at us like, okay, yeah, I know what that is. Then just buy me off, you know. Right. And she had it figured out, and and uh, and I try and tickle her and wrestle with her that she wasn't having anything to do with that, and uh, so. One day she was sitting down and she was playing with Barbies. Now I'm, you know, I'm looking. I'm gonna look at a box of Barbies like I'm gonna look at a box of snakes, okay? Yeah, yeah. And these Barbies are old. I mean, they, they've all looked like they've had plastic surgery. You know, they all right. look like the ugly housewives of Beverly Hills because they, <laughs> our, our daughters own them, and I think some kids own them before that. So and that was an amputee. Where's your arm? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. They've been around a long time, and half of kid them were, pulled it off in 1987. Yeah. I don't so know. she's there, you know, and she's playing with these things, and I, so I sit down with her. And I pick up a Ken doll and I go and I start playing with her. Well, you know, within about five minutes, she was like, "We're we're the best thing since sliced bread." All of a sudden, yeah. You know, to be able to just take time to come down to her level, that's it, and to just spend time in her little world. Yes. And I started to and we and she and she goes, uh, "Barbie loves Ken." I said, "Well, then they should get Barbie and Ken should get married." So so we had a little marriage thing, you know, and yeah, all that yeah, kind of yeah. stuff. And so I'm playing with her, and on her way home from Papa's house, she goes. I have to show Papa my new bedspread tomorrow, Mummy. Like she, all of a sudden, Papa was on the brain because mm-hmm. I'd made the connection. Yeah, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, in light of that, how many kids are missing out 
so much input from an adult because we're just not willing to reach them where they are where they are at that particular season and not just the emotional component of that which is incredibly important to a child's development right but the cognitive development right and and what it means for adults in within that family system to love on those kids um, just just simple touch interaction yeah. playing together right those things all communicate love and and you know I'm giving you my attention I, You're I care accepted. about you yes yeah, yeah. absolutely those are huge look at the, the dissociative properties of a lot of kids in our culture today right and I, I'm <clears throat> drawing a correlation here going okay parents are disengaged right they're with their screens a lot you sure know? and so yep. it, it's it's just a it's a cycle that feeds itself so let's stay in the family stream for a little bit we fast forward a few years now our kids are in you know primary school mm-hmm. they're 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 out there on the playground things are happening they're 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 now starting to learn are they wearing a helmet they're wearing yeah okay. so they're wearing All a helmet right. and elbow okay. pads i'm sure just want to be sure they the playground has soft rubber underneath it so if they <laughs> fall all wooden playground equipment's been removed so they don't get splinters and uh, everything is wow. If you saw the playground we played on when we were there are kids, no corners, <laughs> no it's cor- all rounded edges. It's a wonder we survived. I know, I know. Right in the back of the truck, helmets on bikes. If that was a <laughs> why would you ever? Well, what was that all about? You right. can't go fast enough to wear a helmet. No. <laughs> okay, so oh, so a kid's eight. He's nine. He's ten. He's in that. She's in that age group. They're coming home. They start having questions now about more. Um. Well, they're starting to, to, to learn how to think. They're starting to learn how to process their reading. Um, what does that change look like in how a family begins to continue to teach that child what truth is, what what to believe, what to know, how to process their life at that age, at, yeah. that, at that piece of it? Yeah, that's a hard question for me to answer uh, because that didn't really happen in my family of origin, uh, and I was a public school kid. Uh, right. Um, and then we we began that process with our kids much earlier than eight, nine, sure. and ten. Of so, so for me to you know, I'm like, well, I err on this side or <laughs> on this side, right. trying to find that middle. But um, I, I think the biggest part of that really is. Uh, you know the reading, the reading skills, the aptitude, and the and a love for reading is a is a huge component of this. It's not the the one key that will unlock everything, but it's a huge part. You know, because right. God has revealed Himself to humanity through His Word, right. both the living Word in the person of Jesus, but also in the written Word right. revealed through the prophets and apostles. And so, um, you know, we really emphasized and incentivized the reading of scripture with our kids right and uh that was a huge part of of our of our reality as a family is like i want them to read for themselves and i want them to want to ask mom and dad what about what they don't understand so that we can have conversations and yeah that's good i i uh, was talking to a guy the other day and he said well the bible you know the bible is just really just a fairy tale you know sure and i said to him, well you know if it is a fairy tale it is the best fairy tale that's ever been written. Yeah. Because we're still reading it, we're still talking about it, and people have built destinies around it. So yeah. and I said in half the world, or more than half the world thinks it's true. So if it's a fairy tale, it's it's the best. Right. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> you look at the foundation of our, our of Western civilization, okay, it's built on scripture. It's built yeah. on the values from scripture. Yeah. And you cannot deny that. You may not like that, you may not believe that, right. You may not want to believe it or, or whatever, but it's the reality. You just you don't have to search back far into our own history uh, in America, in Canada, and in England and, and other parts of Europe, and you see the bedrock of Scripture underneath things. So, having that for what it is, um, I just have no problem personally saying I believe. Um, what well, here's what I believe about the Bible. Can I just read to you what Please. I I wrote this? And here's what, because I was asked to write something about the Bible. So, the Bible is a history book. It is a book that is layered. It is history, narrative, symbolic, literal, spiritual, numerical, hidden and revealed, past, present, and future. It is global, eternal, and completely personal. It's a legal treatise, a love letter, and a manual of war. 
Mm-hmm. It's a complete theology, psychology, and it's living, and, and it's living, oh, yeah, and, and living, it is able, it is living, sorry, it's able to inform, perform, build, heal, as well as tear down and destroy. Yeah. It's both ancient and new every morning. Yeah. So that's what I believe scripture is yeah absolutely so i have a high value in fact i think it's i have no higher value of anything written than scripture and i was saying to a friend of mine getting ready for our chat again today that no story has ever been written that you can't find its origin in the bible that's true because there's nothing new under the sun so you can write and you can write Batman or Robin, I'll find you that story in the Bible. I'll find every story ever written, yeah. I can find a, a root, a seed of it in Scripture. Anyway, yeah. that's another thing. So all that to say, in this family river of bringing a child into an understanding of how to discern truth and no truth, yeah, I placed high value as well on teaching my children a foundation of what the scripture teaches. Yes. So now at seven and eight, well, we started when they were four and five, but when at with little stories, but when they got to six, seven, and eight, nine, I started, they had their own child's Bible. We taught them yeah. how to read it. Yeah. We would have a, a, a reading time and we would talk about it. And so I spent a lot of time, my wife spent a lot of time infusing the stories and the truth of the stories and the yeah. applied principle of the story into their young life. Yes. So that was a high value for me. Yeah. Because I wanted them to at least know why the Bible says what it says mm-hmm. and how to discern everything else they're going to hear. Yes. They needed that grid. They need a grid. Yep. Well, the problem is today, so many children don't get any grid from their family. No. That's true. So they're swimming in a sea of of knowledge uncertainty. How how do I figure out is everything that comes in front of me true? Right. And who do I believe? Do I believe a teacher because they stand in a position of authority? Do I believe in a rock star because he's got a thousand or a million fans? Do I believe in the news because of course it never lies? Like you, what what does a child believe if they have no grid underneath them that's been put there by their family? That's it. And and so I think one of the the places where people get hung up is they, even when when they're born again believers, young parents starting their family, and they have a desire to do what you just described, they largely don't know where to start. Fair they enough. Don't, they don't know what to do with that, and um, and it was only through a ton of prayer. And really seeking the Lord that, you know, Jen and I kind of stumbled into and then refined the process that we use with our kids. It was just, we've got to do something. Sure. We, we had that sense of urgency. Uh, we've got to do something. We don't want to just hand them to the state and say, right. educate my child. We, we really want to be uh, not just influencers, but in the early years, the primary of course. Uh, dissemination of information, that source for them. Uh, in their lives. And so I would argue deal. as well that not only is that the job of a parent, um, that is what a parent is going to be held accountable for. Yeah. Um, when it's I look a stewardship. at it, it's a stewardship. So when I look at a child who's an orangutan at 13 or 14 years of age, my first question is, well, what happened in your, what was going on in the yep. formative years of your family? When I see a kid cussing out a cop or cussing out his teacher or right. someone in authority, I go, well, was that tolerated? You were allowed to cuss out your mother? You're allowed to cuss out your grandfather, your uncle, your the neighbor? Mm-hmm. Was there no accountability brought to you in the family stream and yeah. the family grid? So, though you know, it's pretty easy to see sometimes what produces some of this malevolent behavior yeah absolutely. you know so so we got we, we know or, or we're suggesting we're encouraging that a family takes time to really help a young person uh, a young child to develop a a biblical foundation or not and I see when I use the word biblical foundation I that sounds really religious it sounds really uh, churchy. And I want to respect the fact that we have maybe an audience that is not there. But 
but if you if you even want to look at civil how to raise a civilized human being yeah okay yeah the bible has a lot to say about that you can't divorce that process from god no so just just take at least give the bible a chance yeah. to inform you or to at least challenge you yeah even if you do that i'm happy today you know yeah um and as far as you know, a young person, maybe who has said, well, they're a young person, student, listen to our podcast, and they're going, well, jeepers, man, I, I don't even know what a Bible is. You know, mm-hmm. uh, well, go buy one, pick one up, and start reading it. Yeah. And you'll be amazed at what you're going to start to learn about yourself, about the foundation of society, yeah. about who God is, or who he claims to be, at least, you know, uh, because if you, if you don't believe, read about what he says about himself. Right. Make your own mind up. But the fact of the matter is, it's a very important part of that formative stream. So when I was talking about kids being seven or eight, the other thing that we really begin to emphasize as parents is we started to monitor who their friendship circle was. Yes. Because in the formative years of seven, eight, and nine, the precursor to the teens, I'm thinking I want to make sure my children are in a good circle of peers Mm -hmm. that are not going to, that are not going to short circuit what mom and dad are doing at home for them, right. but are going to they're going to be um, co agents. They're going to be kids from families who have the same values. We now, you may think this is completely like, well, man, that that's seems cultish. That's almost cultish. Well, you can call it whatever <laughs> yeah, the heck okay. you, you what you want. Yeah, but I, D and I, we said. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna hang out with families who have the same value system we do. Absolutely. So our kids grow up in a positive peer pressure of the good values. Yes. Things that support the stream of truth. And I'm coming keep coming back to the word truth because right. I want my kids to walk in truth. Right. Right. I want them to know what is true. So I'm gonna walk with families that have that same commitment. Yeah. And that meant we had to say goodbye to some friendships. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't regret it. Because I look now, you know, we're 20 years out, and I go, yeah, that was smart, man. I look at the result. That was a smart move to let that relationship go. Yeah. So we got very deliberate about sleepovers, about who came to play, who was hanging out, where we went and did vacation, who we did vacation with. The kind of people that were in our social network yes. were that were people that, that reinforced you know, what we were teaching our kids. Absolutely. Um, one humorous, the one I got to tell you about that, my, my daughter, Brittany, uh, we had a thing rule about the kind of movies they could watch and different things. And so we we get home one night and there's a, there's a she's over at a friend's house. And uh, here's the message. Hey, dad, mom, uh, we're going to watch a movie right now. And I'm not sure if it's a movie that you would approve of or not. Um, <laughs> so I'm just calling to get permission to see if I can watch it. Oh, but I got to go because it's going to start. <laughs> Click. <laughs> so we had a little Q&A on that when you got home. It was, But the message, I still left awesome. the message. I'm kind of phoning for permission, but... Not really. Nah, I can't get a full yet, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Click. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's cool. Um, okay, so... So we get past just say the seven or eight. You know, you're, they're in sports teams where, where you know they're they're forming, they're learning team sports. That's another good thing I think to put our kids in, into you know environments that mm-hmm. where they have to wrestle, of course, and work with other kids. Um, now they get to teenagers, preteens. You know, maybe junior high. Yeah, uh, which can be real sticky years for families. Yeah, and there's kind of a um, in American life. There's almost an unwritten uh, rule that kids have to rebel. Yeah. And I I went to war with that concept as a young dad. And I said, I, I don't believe rebellion is part of what has to happen in family life. I don't believe it's healthy. I don't believe it's good. And so I'm waging war on rebellion. Yeah. And I, I am going to see my kids move through their teen years, mm-hmm. um, which is why I did a couple of things. Uh, I was really busy when they were junior hires. I, my career was kind of in, in full form. 
And uh, I said, to, I pulled them into my office, the both girls, and I said, oh, guys, I want you to know something. I said, you know, my life's busy. Our family life is busy. We have a very full life. Yeah. I said, I do want you to know, if you girls feel that I'm too busy and you don't feel that you have access to me or that I'm not giving you the time that you need, yeah. I want you to know that you can come into this office, this is my home office, and I said, you can change my schedule. You can say, Dad, you need to slow down for us. Um, and I put, I, I let them know, and I put that, I put that out in front of them, and I said, I want you to know that at any time in your, I said, I, I, I trust you. I know you well enough that you won't, you know, take this flippantly. Yeah. But if you feel at a point in your teen years that you don't have enough time with me, or that I'm not there for you the way I need to be. You can veto my schedule, mm. and I will honor you with wow. that. So things went along pretty good for two or three years, and um, I'm I was getting ready to go on a on a trip. I was going to be speaking at a at a at a, at a opera thing a conference, and uh, the girls walked in to my office and they went, "Dad, you know you had promised that we were going to go skiing, and the weather was all rotten and bad, and we couldn't go." And now we can go, and now you're going to be gone. Mm. And like we really look forward to that, and you kind of promise that you're going to do it. And so we want to, um, we think you're a bit busy right now, too busy. And it hit me like, okay, now here's where the rubber hits the road. Yeah. So I phoned my friend who had booked me for the car. I said, listen, I know this is a really major inconvenience, but I made a promise to my girls. And I said, if I blow my promise right now, I said, it's going to be real bad. So I said, I'm going to have to rain check. I gave him a, a name of a friend who could fill in for me. I arranged it all. And I said, I got a, I got a timeout on this one. He said, I yeah. totally understand. Good. Do you know that, that me doing that was such a adhesive glue in my teenager's relationship with me? Because mm. they knew yeah. that dad valued them more than his ambition, more than yeah. what he was doing. And that when he said something, he was going to back it up with his word. Amen. Now I made a lot of Good. mistakes as a dad. Oh yeah. But that was one of the moments where I knew I I, I got a I got an A on that one. Yeah. You know, because as teenagers, I wanted them to know that there was no question that they couldn't ask. Yeah. They had any time they really needed me, I was going to be there for them, and I wanted them to be aware, and I wanted them to know that that. You don't have to go. You don't have to go outside. You don't have to. You you can make all the mistakes that you make, and you're still safe here in the house, right? To talk about it and process it. Yeah, we you know to that same point. We in campus ministry, and especially you know for us, we we just didn't have a lot of funds. We were raising support for sure. the entirety uh, of the ten years that we were on the campus. So you don't ever yeah. quit raising support, and uh, so money being tight. You know, I was like, what can I do with the kids, you know, mm. to get them out of the house? I can't, yep. we can't spend a lot of money. And Sonic came to our town. You know, we had a drive, suddenly had a Sonic drive in. Sure. And it was like, man, the slushes, they got that half price deal, you know? So I'd, I'd take each one, each kid one on one different nice. days of the week. And we would just go over there and just sit. We we'd, we'd just sit in the car or we'd get yep. out in the grass and sit yep. and, and have a slush, half price slush. And they just loved it. Sure, it, it wasn't anything. It wasn't, you know, like mind blowingly. Didn't blow my mind. It was just like it was just hanging out with dad. You know, it was right. like dad saying, "Hey, I want to spend time with you. Let's go get a slush and just hang out for a little while." And they loved it. Yeah, and it was great. And and I, even today, it's like, well, I I, can't, I could go to Sonic and get a slush, but then I'd be like, oh man, that's jacking me up, you know. <laughs> But I had a high tolerance then, apparently. Sure, I mean, absolutely. So, um, you know, just little things like that. Your parents are maybe watching this, listening to this, going, right. I, I can't afford a ski trip. Well, then just go, you know, take your kid to Sonic and get a slush and hang right. out. And, yeah. You know. It's not the event. It's no, the time. That's it. It's the time component. It's the time component. It's it's the being there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the other thing in that, again, coming back to the formative piece of of that stream for for helping kids understand truth um i wanted them to know that they that any failure that they had they never had to hide it you were never going to get in trouble 
for admitting you made a mistake or even doing something wrong, mm. even if you something willfully wrong, come and talk about it and confess it, and there would be forgiveness. Right. The punishment was going to be in the cover up or the lying about it, not in the not in the offense. Mm. And I and I think that was a very important piece of the of the pie as well in their teenage years, because I wanted to make sure that they always felt that they always felt safe to come home and talk to us. Yeah. And I think when you talk about you know the sl- time time on the grass with the slushies or in the car or on the ski time with and you know by this time now you've created a pattern yeah of those family breakfasts the family dinners right those devotional the you know times story times yeah you've now created a pattern of consistency that you've built yeah over eight nine ten now you're you know they're in their teens 12 or 13 years you got a pattern built yeah that they feel safe within the stream of that river. They feel they can swim there, right? Because they know where the boundary is. They know that yeah. there's there's something really good here that they've 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 got value from. Yeah, absolutely. So so within that family stream, there's a related thought, um, but maybe just a little bit of a shift. Sure. Um, stories are a big part of that stream too, and what you read to your kids, and what you let them read. As they develop yes. that, you know, that ability, those are important parts of this stream of getting truth into our children. Right. And the right stories um, convey biblical truths in really powerful ways that aren't overt, like you're sitting in a Sunday school sure. classroom getting a lesson, right? Right. And so for us, uh, there were just we would we would read these stories together as a family and talk about them. Yeah. And then um, pull out of those stories principles that seem to be applicable to the yes. kids, right? Yeah. So one example, we, we love, well, two, we love Narnia. Yeah. And yep. we love the Lord of the Rings. Right. And um, Two excellent choices. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> in, ter- in terms of just conveying this idea of uh, a Judeo-Christian worldview in right. terms of good and evil and chivalrous and, and people doing the right thing even when it's hard. Uh, those two stories just exemplary. Well, plus Lord of the Rings too. It, it, I always felt that Lord of the Rings was it was about brotherhood. It was about yeah, this, yeah. you know, you you need it. You know, you develop a group of friends and you develop mm-hmm. a group of people and you you walk with them and you wrestle with them and you fight f- through with them. You know, yeah, like it, yeah. it, it really teaches the power of community. You know, absolutely. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. So at, out of that, you know, we we just. We would we would read those stories together, and then the movies came out, you know. Right. And, and then we were like, oh, we got you know. So the kids, the boys especially, just of course, just grew up going, oh yeah, Lord of the Rings and, and, and Narnia, and reading them again, reading the books again and again yeah. and again. And so out of that, like I'll give you one example of a, a principle we pulled from doing that as a family. We we began to say to the boys early, especially when Abby was born, because you know you got two little boys, they're rough and tumble, they wrestle. Yes. And, Play and sword fight, and then suddenly this precious little other thing is in the house, and it's like, yeah, what do you do with this? You know, and they both had this sense of awe with right. her, like she's not like us; she's <laughs> different. And, and I'm like, good, yeah, <laughs> yeah. cultivate that, right? Yeah, that's right. And and so we we would say to them from the from the earliest days of Abby being with us is that boys protect girls. Yeah, that's good. Boys protect girls. Yeah. And then when they got to be preteens, we began to say, boys protect girls. Even when they have to protect the girls from themselves. Interesting. So, so there was an addition as they yeah. moved towards puberty and towards right. like girls stopped being icky and started being lovely, strange, and, <laughs> and a lovely like I right. never seen girls like this before. You know, right? And so yeah. it's like to build on that foundation of something that we had said, that inculcation of the consistency of saying true things to our children again and again and again so that they would even say them back to us without realizing it right or hear us say it for the 800th time and be like oh dad I, you know yes but it's but it's in there it's not just in here it's, it's sunk down into the heart of the right. person and they've 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 embraced the truth yeah not just knowing it but embracing it so that's been a big deal that's good and you know teaching teaching <clears throat> that and and modeling that 
because of course you hit teens and you're going to, you know, you get into sexuality and, and where the boundaries are. And, right. and that of course has been a real shifting. Our culture has made that a shifting target yeah. over the last 50 years. Whereas, you know, monogamous sexual relationships within marriage were normative. That was the normal model. Right. Things outside of that were abnormal. Right. Now today, uh, it seems that a, you know, monogamous sexual relationship within marriage is now the oddity. Yes. Um, i never forget when I took my wife out for our 15th anniversary, okay? We got married. She was 20 when we got married. Mm -hmm. So thir we were 35 years old celebrating our 15th wedding wow. anniversary. We went out to, you know, the keg or whatever it was for a steak and... And we, I said, yeah, this is our anniversary. Oh, that's really cool. How long have you been married? Fifteen years. And like the the wait staff just about dropped dead. We got <laughs> free cake, and you know how how wow. could you possibly be married that long at thirty five? Yeah. Well, you know yeah. that's that's the way it is. But 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 you know you look at that whole sexual move. The bar is constantly moving um, for teenagers today. Yeah. And then we're now we're playing around with the whole gender confusion and all, which this we're going to come back and talk about this at another time. But yeah. but but again, if the family, if truth in the family is not an emphasis, and you don't have good communication with your kids, and you're not talking about these things, yeah. then they're left to make up their mind about this in unhealthy places or with unhealthy pressure right. or with people that don't really care about them. Right. You know. So, you know. Okay, go ahead. I was just saying, when, when parents deliberately inculcate their children in this way, what, what you'll begin to see, if you're, if you're, especially if you're a younger parent watching, right. listening, uh, if you engage in this process, you'll begin to see your kids live it out. And, and especially in their early years, it's, it takes really precious right. forms. And I'll give you an example. This, this, is, this stayed with me. It will always stay with me. You know, the boys protect girls thing, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so we, we were, I remember Abby was just, she had just started toddling and, and walking on her own and wanted to go outside and play. And, and so I, I had been saying to the boys, you got, you got to watch out for Abby, yeah. protect boys, protect girls. Yeah. And I, I don't know how the conversation came up about, you know, living in Georgia, we have a lot of eagles, sure. but we have buzzards and oh. they're big. And they'll swoop down and take a rabbit or take a take a pet, okay. you know, um, okay. like an eagle will. Yeah. And so uh, the grandparents, I think Jen's parents, had had been to the fair with the kids and had bought the boys these uh, bamboo uh, bows. bow and arrows and the little nice. so so a wooden dowel with yeah. a eraser on the tip nice. for the for the arrow, <laughs> right? And they've got these. And so I, t I told the boy, I say, Abby, Abby wants to go outside. You guys can go play in the yard, right? Um, but just remember, protect your, watch your sister, yeah. protect your sister. And we're standing in the house, Jen and I are talking, the kids have gone outside, and I see them going across the front yard. And, and so the first thing I see come past the garage is little Abigail. You right. know, she's just kind of, just, kinda you know, back and forth, there. you yeah. know, like a, like a little toddler does. And then I see the boys come behind her, and they're both, they have their, <laughs> their bows drawn, <laughs> watching the sky as they cover their sister. And I was like... That, that is beautiful. That, that they is got the it, best baby. moment. Is like they, so they're good. fully committed to watching over her, right. protecting her. And now you know she's she's almost fifteen, right. going on twenty one. She's yeah. she's really tall. She looks yeah. older than she is. She looks seventeen, eighteen. Right. And uh, they just had their prom, you know. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and I'm like. I'm so grateful. Right. Because the boys are still Now right the boys there. are walking behind her with shotguns. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> They're still protecting her, still watching over her. So you felt completely comfortable raising your daughter in a patriarchal, sexist, boys are oh. need that you felt totally okay with that? Heck yeah, man. Really? Okay. Yeah. This is, well, this is something about God's you design. You definitely are not, even, a, you're not woke, are even you? When this, even when the culture goes sideways and starts gaslighting you for like right. being biblical, it's like, well... Yeah, well, the thing is... I'll live. So, okay, you know, when we go... You know, I could see some women really kicking back about this, okay? That's fine. And I go, so would you rather have men I'm, not protect you? Right. Would you rather be out there then and something goes bad, something goes sideways, mm -hmm. and the guy just walks by? I remember... I was coming home from from uh, when I lived in downtown Vancouver years ago, and I'm coming home from from work. I'm taking the bus, and I get to the the stop. I get off, and I see a, a woman. She's probably maybe 18 or 19, and there's a guy pushing her up against the side 
of the store trying to feel her up. Mm-hmm. So I I said, are you okay? And she goes, yeah, I could see the fear on her face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I literally grabbed that guy from the back and I just threw him out into the traffic and he almost got hit by a car. Mm. And, mm. and he just kind of ran off into the... And she just stood there. That poor girl was shaking like a leaf. Yeah. I said, are you okay? She goes, yeah, thank you. She said, I think I was going to be raped. Wow. Right? Now, that was a, that was a, that's one moment that that, so would you rather, you know, I was raised that boys protect girls. Yeah. Would you rather me have not been raised to do that? What would have happened to that poor girl that night? Yeah. Right? So you can, see, you know, you can have all the theory you want around it, but I want a culture where young men respect women enough yes. to watch out for their safety yeah, because men are physically stronger in most cases, uh, unless you're, you know, maybe a Russian uh, Olympiad or something. But, <laughs> but, but, but mo- in most cases, East German women's wrestling team. Yeah. But in most cases, a guy is physically stronger and he should be in that place to protect and serve and, Absolutely. and, 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 and watch out for yeah. do you want a culture i saw the other day you know with the latest fashion for you know 2021 was this man walking down the gangway dude and, you know like don't get I'm, me I, yeah i'm uh, sorry but i mean oh, so i I'm just triggered i'm triggered i'm trigger warning <laughs> trigger warning i'm triggered mike's gonna blow Woo. but but you see that again coming back to that family stream this is where those values are taught and imputed into a into a child and a young person and if you don't do it there, then you got to make up for lost time, or you or you raise a generation of yes, twisted people. That's it. But it goes. I think we we got to take it further back. It, it's a it's a Genesis thing. It's a created order thing. It, right. It is the mandate God gave to Adam to protect and serve. Right. And that's that's part of the created order. Men and women are fundamentally different. In the way that God made us, we're both fully human beings, right? But we do not have the same disposition. We do not have the same calling, right? Right. And so, to protect and to serve, not just the, the slogan on the side of the police vehicle, it, it's God's mandate to men from the very beginning. So, why is it that we have such a difficulty with the concept of equal but different? Yeah, that's hard for people. I, I don't understand why, though. Yeah, because you know, equality can still celebrate difference. But we've conflated equality with equity. Right. We've conflated the two yes. things. Yes, yes. Equal outcome. we we got to have equal, equal yes. everything. If a yes. man can do that, then a woman should be able to do that. And I'm right. like, well, let me know when guys can pop out babies because that doesn't go the other way. Right. There's some things that we can't do that women can do, and there's some things that women can do that we can't do, and that's okay. Right. It's it's part of how God made humanity. Yeah. But we're just so set on this equity thing. We've got to all have all the same amount of all the same things and be able to do all the same things and it's it's just it's just absurd. It's almost like emotional communism. Yeah. It's yeah. like everyone is equal. Except when you go into the Soviet Union back in the communist times and I traveled back in mm-hmm. in before the wall came down and I did a lot of work in Eastern Europe and, and in those places and yeah. been into many former Soviet countries. And and what I always found interesting about communism was you had communism for the masses and then there was the Communist Party. Right. The Communist Party really was an elite <laughs> was an elite group that had privilege and mm-hmm. enjoyment far beyond what the masses had. Absolutely. It was the biggest load of BS that you've ever wanted to right. embrace in your entire life. Right. Okay, as a as a manifesto about equal it wasn't equality. I tell you it was a no. lot of things, but equal wasn't one of them. And and the fact of the matter is now we're living in a culture and we're kind of wandering off the topic a little bit about but but as far as the the coming back to the family thing and the male female in this family stream of where we teach our young people and where we input into our young people what truth is, we have to wrestle with those issues. Absolutely. We have to wrestle with sexuality and human value and what is sacred. Right. 
And I told my daughters when a very young age, your sexual life is sacred. Yes. It's sacred to it you. Is. Don't don't burn it it's off. Holy before the Lord. Yeah, don't burn it off at the altar of peer pressure or right. burn it off at the altar of some kid in a nineteen seventy four Vega and he's buying you right. a Big Mac at McDonald's. Right. It doesn't work that way, no. you know. And I made a covenant with my both my daughters when they were thirteen. I took them out for I mean, I did it right. I took yeah, them out yeah. to a special dinner. We sat down. I talked about this very issue. Yeah. And I didn't want them to date till they were 17 years of age. And here was the reasons why. Because right. I didn't feel you were emotionally ready for it. And people, I mean, I know today this sounds like you oh, know science man. fiction. You like, are out of I'm your mind. I'm absolutely out of my mind. But I have two wonderful daughters who, with, who saved themselves. They got married to, to great young guys who were raised with a similar philosophy <laughs> And yeah. and their families and their marriages are well on the way to being successful. Mm-hmm. And I look at that and I go, that was all imputed. That was all taught in the family stream. Yes. We haven't even got to the other streams yet. No. But in that family stream, all that success came from right there. And that maybe this is a bridge to the second stream i don't sure. know how far we'll get today well we might have, we're gonna we're gonna probably go to another session so okay, okay. so we'll probably take a break and, and bring up the, the second stream so then let's set up the transition sure. in this way okay because the men that married your daughters right that were equipped properly given the correct worldview prepared for life in in every way that you and your wife could prepare them probably found their husbands in the church or if they didn't they're actively involved with their husbands in the church now. That that would be a high value, that environment, that stream being just a close second behind the family stream continues to show itself to be a very important piece of who they are as people and their families. Well, I think that's a great segue because we will get into that as we go into the next section about the the stream of the spiritual stream or the yep. church stream. Yeah. And there's an old ancient story from the scriptures about uh, you can't, you know, uh, don't be unequally yoked. Mm-hmm. Now, the yoke is, you know, is a wooden harness that uh, a farmer would, would put two animals in, yeah. uh, two oxen or two, you know, horses or whatever, two donkeys. But you would never mar- you would never yoke a donkey with a bull or... Or an oxen with a horse, like yeah, because you, you, it just doesn't. The temperament You're doesn't work. You just, it's a mess. Yeah, and so the unequally yoked concept was this concept about making sure that things are teamed up that fit. Yeah, right. And how do you make that work? Well, we're going to look at that maybe in our next in our next stream, and or in the next uh, podcast. So let's uh, we'll take a break. Thanks for thanks for watching uh, this episode as we tackle the issue of truth. My good friend Mike Satterfield and I are here. Um, Thanks for joining us on Thought Rock. Uh, We are at the beginning of a thought revolution, and we want to think foundationally about what truth is and what it means. And so today we looked at the stream of the family and how family influences a truthful understanding and a truthful worldview. And we're going to expand on that uh, when we do our next uh, program which we're going to do in about 10 minutes. And, uh, <laughs> and so you can get it right away. And uh, thanks for tuning in. If you uh, like what you heard today, uh, hit like and share us. And uh, we want to help as many people as we possibly can to discover truth. Thanks for tuning in. And have a great day.